Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unconfirmed, the show that reveals how the marquee names in crypto are reacting to the week's top headlines and can see inside scoop on what they see on the horizon. I'm your host, Laura Shin, a journalist with over two decades of experience. I started covering crypto five years ago and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full time. Unchained and Unconfirmed are now published as videos. If you're not yet subscribed to the Unchained YouTube channel, head to youtube.com slash C slash Unchained podcast and subscribe today. Crypto.com is giving away four Teslas. To enter the lucky draw, download the Crypto.com app and buy at least $100 worth of Bitcoin. Download the Crypto.com app now. With Sun Exchange, you can easily earn Bitcoin while offsetting your carbon footprint and delivering solar energy to the world. Unconfirmed listeners get their first solar cell free by visiting sunexchange.com slash unconfirmed. Today's guest is Leah Thompson, also known as Girl Gone Crypto. Welcome, Leah. Laura, thank you so much for having me as a guest on the show. I'm definitely excited to be here and chatting with you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk with you. So everyone, by the time this show comes out, I will have been on vacation for almost a week. And so before I left, which is at the time of this recording, I was, you know, looking for a fun interview to do since I wouldn't be able to do a show tied to the news. And Leah, you have some of the most fun and entertaining and smart videos on crypto that I've seen. You're well known for your weekly crypto news videos called The Crypto Minute, in which you recap the news with one-liners that you shoot in a variety of different costumes and settings. Um, but you also do a, a variety of different styles of interviews. So why don't you give us an overview of your crypto video work? Yeah. So um, as you said, I, I do this kind of fun, entertaining uh, infotainment, if you will, type of um, news recap from the week and just try to think of really creative ways to kind of talk about the news, like you said, with various costumes and shots and things like that. So um, it's been it's been fun to kind of evolve that. I started that um, video series about six months ago. Um, and then kind of to note as well, I, I do interviews and other kind of educational uh, content as well. But I would say that the Crypto Minute's uh, probably my favorite type of video that I make. <laughs> so why don't you walk us through what it's like to create one of your recaps? And I actually picked one that I really love, which is your 2020 end of year review. And for listeners, I'll actually play the video now on the video so you can see that. If you're listening on audio, you can listen to the audio, but I really urge you to find the link in the show notes and actually watch the video if you can, because the full context really, um, really just brings to life the full experience. 2020 year in review, let's go. Bitcoin has risen from $3,600 in March all the way up to $28,000 in December, which is over 600% increase. Huh. Bitcoin having? Try Bitcoin tripling. <laughs> this year created some big institutional whales. Hi, I'm Michael Saylor. Well, this went to zero. Happy birthday, Bitcoin white paper. I'm a savage. <gasps> Ethereum to put on a house. The Fed printed $9 trillion this year. To infinity and beyond. Bitcoin is the best performing asset this year. And decade. 50 shades of grayscale. Oops, come here, I got the goods. Whew. NFTs. Whew, was a hot DeFi summer. Careful buying food tokens or else you could get sentenced to eternal yamnation. Hmm. Let's talk about Bitcoin. Is it all season yet? No. Is it all season now? No. Is it all? Oh my God. Hi, Jack. The Bitcoin pizza would now be worth $270 million. Well, hey, all you crypto cats and kittens. Hey, pal. Welcome. 2021 is going to be smoking. So, Leah, that was amazing. Loved that. Can you tell <laughs> us how you choose the different ways you'll portray these different news events? Like, you know, if we just contrast some of the scenes in this video, you've got the one where you've got the glasses and cardigan outfit with the chart showing the rise in Bitcoin, kind of this like educator look or librarian look or something. <laughs> and then in the next one, you're, you know, juggling these tequila limes to discuss Bitcoin, <laughs> the Bitcoin price tripling. And then a cut to, you know, you pretending to be Michael Saylor in a whale costume. So how did you come <laughs> up with those different ideas and, and, you know, piece that all together? Yeah. So generally what I do is um, just kind of throughout the, the week, I'll, you know, find, list out different news stories. And then for this one in particular, obviously it was like the year in review. So I was really going through the past year and like, what were some of the biggest stories that happened? So I'll kind of list that all out. And then just, I guess, really like sit with it and think about if there's any like interesting or, or fun or creative way that I could maybe portray that, whether it's a play on words or if it's 
um, maybe a, a costume like like you mentioned the Michael Saylor like you know he's become a a big Bitcoin whale with MicroStrategy right so I was like I could do a whale costume um, you know with the limes it was talking about the price of Bitcoin tripling so I was juggling three limes so I mean I don't know it's just sometimes it's just uh, trying to be playful trying to poke a little bit of fun at things but you know make it kind of educational as well. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know, I guess I just spend, spend some time just kind of really thinking through each line. And so how long does it take you to create these one minute videos? And when I mean that, I don't mean just the filming of it, but from, you know, the brainstorming to publication. So each video probably takes between six to eight hours, um, to produce just just depending on, um, you know, I want to say how many costume changes there are, but, you know, really like the process of thinking through the lines, then filming and then editing and, and distributing. Um, but yeah, probably about six to eight hours. And so for each of these shots, do you have to do multiple takes or are you so good that you tend to get it on the first try? <laughs> So um, some of them take a few takes, but actually uh, my sister um, helps me film them, which is a lot of fun because th then we just get to like ha hang out every week and, you know, kind of film these <laughs> videos together. But um, every once in a while, we'll get one in the first shot and I'm like, all right, we got a one take wonder here today. <laughs> so... <laughs> Awesome. So that's because sometimes there is this other person in video who actually, yeah, she does look a little bit like you and has the same color hair, at least. So <laughs> is that's your sister, I presume? Yeah, yeah. She's a she's a super creative person. And so I was like, you know, it'd be fun to have someone help film because you can get a little bit cooler shots than if it's just me with a tripod. And also it's a little awkward, especially if I'm filming outside to like just have me in a tripod, like outside filming things. And so it makes it a little more comfortable to have another person there uh, filming as well. But it's just it's just kind of a fun excuse to get to hang out as well. <laughs> And, and also, are you, like, because I'm, I'm really impressed, you know, let's put it this way. Normally with this kind of thing, you have different people in all these different roles, like the writer and then the actor and then the, the director, et cetera. But you're kind of like doing it all. Am I right? Or do you outsource different parts of this? So um, I do most of it myself. I do have um, a friend of mine that's in the crypto community that is just, I think he's like super creative. So I actually, sometimes he helps me come up with some shot ideas. I'll be like, hey, I haven't thought of a good one for this line yet. What do you think? And so I've got a, a friend that I can kind of bounce that off of. And then sometimes while we're filming, my sister might come up with an idea. So I kind of feel like I've got this, you know, great kind of group of creative people that are helping to contribute. But um, in terms of, you know, deciding on the news stories and doing the editing and, and all of that, um, I do that myself. And so in general, what are the biggest challenges challenges that you face in creating these videos? That's an interesting question. I would say it's really just deciding which uh, news stories to cover, especially right now. There's so much happening all the time that, you know, it, it seems like, you know, when I started this series six months ago, I was like, OK, what else could I include? I need to find five more stories. And now I'm like cutting stories because there's just so many things happening every week. <laughs> that I, I totally hear you on that. I totally got it. When when you do start I'm assuming, so maybe you start with like 20 ideas, then how do you whittle it down to which ones you're going to include? And yeah, what are your favorite memories of creating some of these ideas for how to portray one of the news events? Yeah, so usually when I'm going through and kind of deciding which ones to pick, it'll either be like, one, this is such a big story, like, of course, I have to cover it this week, or two, I just have a funny idea for it. So sometimes that prioritizes it. Um, and so in terms of like memories uh, or favorite, you know, kind of moments from filming these vlogs um, or these, uh, the Crypto Minute. I have to say, I'm, I'm glad you picked the the 2020 year in your view because that was the one I probably had the the most fun with just coming up with different things. Um, I've also kind of started uh, posting some like blooper reels here and there because it, sometimes things go really, really wrong on set, <laughs> you know, when we're doing, doing these and the shots go what, crazy. What are some like, examples? Um, okay, so um, and the, I was talking about sushi, and so I had a plate of sushi, and I was trying to um, imitate a rug pull, so I was like tripping. But anyway, the sushi went flying, and I was trying to hang on to it, and just things like that. Uh, I have a, one of those money printer guns. So whenever I'm talking about like maybe like Janet Yellen or the Fed or you know quantitative easing or printing money, um, and it just makes a mess, like these fake dollar bills, like all over my living room. And uh, sometimes I'll find them later. I actually, this was kind of funny. I had a friend 
over and she found one of these fake, they're fake hundred dollar bills, um, like somewhere. And she's like, look, a hundred dollar bill. And I was like, oh, it's fake. And she was like, why do you have fake hundred dollar bills in your couch? Like, it was just like, I had to explain the whole thing. So <laughs> it's just, it's a lot of kind of fun moments, I guess, come up from that, you know? <laughs> Where did you get that uh, money, fake money printer? Oh, just Amazon. Uh, I think it was like 20 bucks. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a great purchase. <laughs> and are you going to, I guess you'll reuse the whale costume as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got some some good staples that I feel like will come out more often. Like I've got a good whale costume. I've got some good bear ears now. If I'm talking about Bitcoin bears, you know, there's a few that I was like, I should probably. I've got an astronaut costume now to talk about going to the moon. So, been trying to think about staples. A unicorn costume. If I ever talk about Uniswap, you know, those kinds of things. So, oh my god, I love it. You're like the living map, uh, crypto mascot. <laughs> All right. So in a moment, we're going to talk about how Girl Gone Crypto got into crypto. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Join thousands of people from around the world who are earning Bitcoin while creating a more sustainable energy future with Sun Exchange. On the Sun Exchange platform, you can easily buy solar cells that power schools, businesses, and other organizations in sunny emerging markets. You'll earn Bitcoin for 20 years from the clean energy you generate while offsetting your carbon footprint. Unconfirmed listeners get their first solar cell free by visiting sunexchange.com slash unconfirmed. That's S-U-N-E-X-C-H-A-N-G-E dot com slash unconfirmed. Back to my conversation with Leah Thompson, aka Girl Gone Crypto. So yeah, tell us your crypto origin story. Yeah, so I first heard about Bitcoin actually back in 2011. I had a friend who like filled his entire apartment with mining rigs, was super <laughs> into mining Bitcoin. And th so that was my first impression of, of Bitcoin was, you know, what is this super nerdy, weird computer thing? I mean, the apartment was so hot with all these mining rigs running. It was just this very kind of like <laughs> odd first experience. <laughs> and so I, I kind of thought at first, I was like, oh, well, I mean, that's cool that you're doing this, but Bitcoin is maybe for people, you know, for nerds, you know, if you want to overclassified. But um, then I, you know, I kind of kept hearing about it. Uh, this same friend was kind of poking me to buy Bitcoin. And I wish I had listened to him earlier, um, you know, as I'm sure many of us do. But um, in kind of early mid 2017 is when I, I really started getting um, more into crypto myself. And so um, I ran across um, this blogging platform called Steemit. And I don't know if you're familiar, um, but it basically is where you can earn crypto for posting. So anyway, I started doing that and I started earning crypto. And what was really interesting about that is I it caused me to really go down the rabbit hole and start asking a lot more questions once I physically had some crypto in my hands. Like, well, what gives this value? Can I convert it to real money, air quotes for those listening, <laughs> which is funny now to <laughs> think of it that way. <laughs> um, you know, what? what is this thing called an exchange? Um, you know, what is this thing called a wallet, a hardware wallet? Like just really started to ask all those questions and start educating myself more and learning more on crypto. Um, and then started kind of poking around, you know, seeing what other coins maybe I might want to invest in and then got to experience the whole last bull run and um, have just kind of been here in the crypto space, you know, kind of casually um, between, I would say, you know, that time and then kind of mid 2019 is when I decided to to launch Gorg on Crypto. Uh, but the way that kind of came about even is really interesting because um, because I was blogging on Steemit like pretty, um, you know, consistently almost every day, even though I wasn't blogging or making videos about crypto related things, because it's a pretty big, at the time, you know, it was a pretty big like art community. So I was doing random like ukulele covers and recipes, just, I don't know, really random things. Um, but people started asking me to come speak at crypto conferences because a lot of the people that were on that platform were obviously based within the crypto world. Um, and I was like, me? Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, I I don't talk about crypto, but um, they just thought my story was interesting, um, you know, of like earning crypto for playing my ukulele and, <laughs> you know, all of these things. And so I started traveling and speaking at a few crypto conferences and 
after about a year or so of that, I was like, you know, I should just try launching a crypto channel. It would be a great way for I'm obviously passionate about it. I, it's, you know, where I've been choosing to invest, you know, time and energy and funds and all of those things. And so um, that could be kind of a fun way for me to learn more. I could interview people. I could um, just kind of grow my own knowledge while also making content. So it just kind of felt like the universe was pushing me <laughs> in that direction. So, uh, so yeah, about mid 2019, I launched Girl Gone Crypto and, uh, and then here, here we are. <laughs> and yeah. And so how did that journey go? Like, how has your user base grown? What were some of the pivotal moments? Like, do you feel like there was a particular video or like scene that you shot where like that really caught people's attention or? Mm, yeah. So when I first started uh, making content, I, I mostly just did interviews because I'm like, you know what, I even though I've been in the crypto space at that point for a few years, kind of educating myself, I didn't feel like I really um, could make videos really like speaking um, and educating yet. I was like, I feel like I still have so much to learn. So I just started interviewing a bunch of people. And that was the majority of my content for probably the first year, um, or, you know, eight months to a year. And um since I've kind of pivoted to get a little bit more into some more of the creative stuff, which is more of what I'm doing now, uh, which is also I'm still doing interviews. But um, I, one of the kind of uh, pivotal moments, actually, that I think really has given way to a lot more of this kind of more creative content I've been doing was uh, J.K. Rowling uh, was tweeting about Bitcoin. It was this huge thing. You know, now, obviously, we've had more celebrities tweeting about Bitcoin recently, <laughs> but that was like a really big <laughs> moment, um, you know, in time. And I, I, I don't know why, but I just was like, Oh, I should, I should make a response video. That's like Harry Potter themed. <laughs> I don't know where the idea came from exactly, but um, I called it the muggles guide to Bitcoin. And anyway, I just kind of put it in Harry Potter terms. And that's just been such a fun piece of content. Even to this day, you know, even though I posted it back in May, people like the first thing they'll say to me is I love your Harry Potter video, or I, I never could get my kids to watch information about Bitcoin, but they love your Harry Potter video. <laughs> and so it's just, it's been really, uh, that was just a really fun, uh, not just a fun piece of content on its own, but I think it kind of opened my eyes a little bit like, wow, people like this kind of sillier, maybe more fun, but still smart kind of content. And so I, I think that was kind of a turning point for me too. Yeah. Yeah. That is a great video. It has a quarter of a million views. And it, did she ever respond to that? She didn't, but that that's okay. I uh, oh, I've come to bummer. terms with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully she's hopefully she's watched it because it is a really good explainer. I love it. And out of curiosity, I w when I was watching, I was like, wait, did she have to get like copyright permission? Like I was just wondering how that works because there's kind of a lot of scenes from Harry Potter, and I was like. Anyway, I was just wondering how that part works. Yeah, that's a really um, interesting question. And so all the research I had done, and to be honest, I'm still not 100% sure that I'm correct on this, um, is that footage, if it's not the main purpose of the video, and if I'm not using any audio from the video, um, is eligible for use under um, like kind of fair use kind of things. But to be honest, I am um. more cautious now as I'm going forward, because even if something might technically be under fair use, that doesn't mean that you might not run into issues in the future. And so um, as my kind of channels have continued to grow, I've, I've mm. been more conscious of, of, of that sort of thing. And so, uh, so yeah, I do have, um, for those who haven't seen it, I recorded with the green screen and then put a bunch of Harry Potter footage behind me. Um, and so, so yeah, that's actually still something I'm not 100% positive on. <laughs> so... Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, well, maybe we can look that up because I was wondering, um, you know, because I think it's like a two minute video or something, but it is a bunch of different scenes. It's not like one continuous right. piece. Um, yeah. And it, so, uh, you know, what are all the different social media platforms that you reach people on? And what do you find are the differences of the crypto audience between these different platforms? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Twitter is probably the platform I'm the most um, active on. And I feel like with Twitter, one thing that I, I love about that in terms of the audience and the people that are there is it's such a mix of kind of OG cryptos. And then you've got traders, you've got people that are new to crypto, you've got um, people that are kind of in this like middle section, I would say, where maybe they understand a certain amount, but they want to learn more. And there's maybe certain topics that they're like, I don't totally get that yet. And so that's kind of my core audience, I would say, that I'm really thinking about when I'm making a lot of more like educational kind of content is the people that know what the word blockchain means. They know, you know, what some of these things are, but some of these maybe finer details, they're, 
you know, wanting to kind of dive into a little more. So um, I like that on Twitter, you have such a mix. Um, on YouTube, I would say it's also a mix, but definitely have a little bit more of the like beginner kind of people are searching for information, they're searching for, you know, they're trying to learn actively. And so you maybe have more of that crowd. Uh, TikTok is another platform that I'm I'm pretty active on, um, you know, making some more of that kind of creative type content that we've talked about, but in more of like a TikTok, uh, TikTok format. And those are very, very beginner entry level, um, I would say, in terms of their understanding of Bitcoin and their interest in it. And so that's been really actually kind of exciting for me to get to speak to to that audience of people that are truly like maybe they know what Dogecoin is and that's about it. And, and But there's more, I'm seeing more and more interest in terms of learning more about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in that kind of realm as well. <laughs> and so is this um, like a hobby for you? Are you able to make income this way? Or, you know, how does this combine with your other work? Yeah. So um, I have actually just recently, um, only about a month ago, uh, quit my my day job, if you will, and have gone full time here in crypto, which is really exciting. I worked uh, for the same company and it was a tech company. I worked there for like eight years. And so it was a big, big decision to to leave that and kind of jump, jump into this. But um, yeah, I've been really grateful. I've got some awesome sponsors that have helped to support my channels. Um, but also, it's it's kind of funny. This isn't something I really set out to to do, but I I, I joke that I have a video production company because uh, crypto brands will reach out to me saying, "Hey, we need to get these tutorials made for our website about our you know our wallet or our you know project, whatever it is." And are you interested? Can we hire you to make you know videos for us? And so that's been kind of an unexpected, also like additional um, kind of line of work, if you will, is um, just kind of working with some of these crypto brands to help distill down their message of what they're trying to say and make educational content about their their products uh, for their customer base. Oh, that's great. Perfect. So now that you've made the sleep, what do you have planned next? You know, I'm just so excited for 2021 to really double down on all of this to make more content, to make the content better. Um, you know, I'm always thinking about how can I up the production quality? How can I make it more interesting? Um, so I'm just really excited to, I, I don't know if this sounds cheesy, but to say just kind of explore like my own curiosity and excitement and, and see what what people are getting stoked about and, and do more of that. So um, so yeah, I just think 2021 is going to be a really, a really fun year for, for making content. Great. And before we go, are there any other favorite videos that you want to urge the listeners to watch? Or, or just maybe favorite scenes that you want to give a backstory for, for some of the, the like, I know you told us some of the bloopers, but if there's any, any <laughs> other stories you want to add? One of the things that I've been really kind of working on and like having some fun with is taking my more educational videos and adding in elements of what I do in the crypto minute to those. And that's been a more recent change. It's been a lot of fun where like maybe I'll do an explanation video. I have like a two minute crypto explainer video series where I try to take topics and kind of break them down in just a couple of minutes, but adding in kind of costumes, and kind of silly, um, you know, footage and B-roll and things to make them a little bit more engaging because really my, my goal is to make learning about crypto feel a lot more approachable and fun. Um, yeah, I know that a lot of content can feel a little bit technical and a little overwhelming. And if you're just trying to learn about something and it's all, you know, like these big hour long videos that might feel a little overwhelming to dive into. And so um, just kind of short bite size tutorials. Um, but like, for example, I recently did a video on um, explaining what a hardware wallet is and how to use it. And, you know, I was kind of joking about like hackers and I like I have a ninja costume. And so on screen, I'm like in a ninja costume. So just trying to make even um, educational videos a little bit more entertaining, too. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, it's been so fun having you on Unconfirmed. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me as a guest, Laura. I'm a huge fan of your show and what you do. And it really is an honor to be a guest here on your show. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you uh, have been a listener and glad that we were able to do this, especially when I'm on vacation. It's the perfect, perfect way to, um, to have some fun time here on this otherwise serious news show. <laughs> All right. Well, don't forget, next up is the weekly news recap. Stick around for This Week in Crypto after this short break. Crypto.com is giving away four Teslas. To enter the lucky draw, download the Crypto.com app and buy at least $100 of Bitcoin before March 8th. New Crypto.com app users also enjoy 0% credit and debit card fees in their first month. 
increase your chances of winning by applying for the Crypto.com Visa card, which gives you up to 8% back along with rebates for your Spotify, Netflix, and Amazon Prime subscriptions. More details can be found in the show notes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this week's news recap. If you're watching on video and you're thinking, that's not where Laura usually records, yes, you are right. I made the most perfectly timed vacation ever and am on holiday in one of the only spots in the country that isn't totally snowed in and frozen and potentially also eat a, out of water, heat, and um, electricity. For those of you who are suffering under those conditions, I do hope that you get all your utilities back soon. All right, time for this week's crypto news recap. First headline, Bitcoin blows past 50K, institutional investors dip their toes in. The flagship crypto had another landmark week after passing the halfway mark to 100K on early Monday morning and pushing up to a new all-time high at 52K by mid-Wednesday. On-chain analyst Willie Wu, in an interview on the Investors Podcast Network, estimates the top of the current bull run will reach $102,000, roughly doubling Bitcoin's current price. He went on to explain that his models estimate a bear floor of $30,500, a prediction that, if true, means we will never see sub-30k Bitcoin again. In a Thursday morning tweet storm, Wu updated his prediction saying that Bitcoin is showing, quote, strong support at 48k. Crypto analyst Plan B in the same podcast interview says we are still in the infancy of a bull run and that, quote, we have at least half a year to go. Plan B, using data from previous bull runs in 2013 and 2017, estimates Bitcoin's price topping out anywhere between 100k and 300k. Running parallel to the rise in the Bitcoin price is the increase in institutional adoption and interest in Bitcoin. In the last week, BlackRock CIO Rick Reeder said the asset management giant, quote, is starting to dabble in crypto. Bloomberg reported that Morgan Stanley's $150 billion counterpoint global investment unit is considering placing a bet on Bitcoin. Bond king Jeffrey Gunlack, who had previously been negative about Bitcoin, tweeted that it may be, quote, the stimulus asset. And Deutsche Bank is aiming to develop a custody platform for digital assets. In addition to these new institutions getting into crypto, MicroStrategy announced plans to raise another $600 million to purchase Bitcoin through the sale of senior convertible notes. The company already owns 71,079 Bitcoin, worth about $3.7 billion at publishing time. While not institutional news, rapper Jay-Z and Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey, who are institutions unto themselves, are donating 500 BTC toward Bitcoin development in Africa and India. Next headline, Coinbase facilitated Tesla's Bitcoin purchase, private shares trading at a $77 billion valuation. The block reported that Tesla used Coinbase in its $1.5 billion purchase of Bitcoin. While neither Tesla nor Coinbase was available for comment, sources familiar with the deal said the purchase was executed over several days in early February using a similar workflow to that used for MicroStrategy, in which the order was routed to several OTC trading desks. Coinbase is currently valued at $77 billion based on trading of the company's privately held shares via the Nasdaq private market, where individual shares are being traded for $303. Coinbase plans to go public later this year with a direct listing, a technique popularized by Spotify and Palantir, in which Coinbase will post its shares directly onto the exchange. Next headline, Robinhood takes heat in, in congressional hearings, promises to someday allow crypto withdrawals. Robinhood, Citadel, Melvin Capital, Reddit, and trader Keith Gill, aka Roaring Kitty, testified in front of the U.S. House of Financial Services Committee on Thursday afternoon in regards to the GameStop mania and Robinhood's decision to dis suspend trading on certain stocks. Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenev did not directly answer Representative Maxine Waters' yes or no question about whether or not Robinhood faced a liquidity problem that forced it to shut off purchases of GameStop and other stocks on its platform during the height of the GameStop mania. In a series of tweets on Wednesday, Robinhood said it intended to allow customers to deposit and withdraw cryptocurrencies. Customers currently only have the option to purchase or sell crypto on the platform. 
Robinhood further clarified that it does not invest in cryptocurrency and intend for its actions to be systemic, objective, and derived from first principles going forward. Robinhood did not give a timetable for when deposits and withdrawals would be enabled. Next headline, Dapper Labs gets a $2 billion valuation as NFTs grab big names. NFT startup Dapper Labs is closing in on a $250 million round of new funding after the rapid growth of its NBA Top Shot NFT product. The deal would value the firm at $2 billion. NBA Top Shot recently saw two digital cards sell for $100,000 apiece. A LeBron James from the top and a Zion Williamson Polo MMXX. Dapper Labs, previously on Unchained, has so far seen $100 million in revenue from sales of its first successful NFT product, CryptoKitties, and NBA Top Shot. Another project to keep an eye on is The First 5,000 Days, a digital artwork by Beeple, a previous guest on the show, hosted by blockchain-based digital art platform Maker's Place. It will be, quote, the first purely digital artwork to be sold by a major auction house which will be the venerated Christie's, which will also be accepting Ether as payment. Jesse Walden, founder of Media Chain Labs, who was also a previous guest on Unchained, published an essay titled NFTs Make the Internet Ownable, in which he uses his years in the music industry to explain how NFTs fix problems that creators have had on the internet. He writes, quote, In media, NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, make it possible for creators to retain ownership of their content without limiting the propagation of their files across the internet. As a result, NFTs have the potential to invert the ownership model of media, offering creators, their audiences, and developers who build for them a viable alternative to platform-driven monetization. Walden says NFTs cannot be copied, edited, pasted, or manipulated by anyone. NFTs unlock the ability to uniquely own digital media assets, he says, in the same way that Bitcoin allows for a unique ownership of digital financial assets. Read the full essay to see where Jesse thinks the space is going and where we, where we are in the adoption cycle. Next headline, DeFi Roundup. On Wednesday, crypto asset manager Bitwise announced the Bitwise DeFi Crypto Index, the first DeFi index fund, which provides a vehicle through which accredited investors can bet on DeFi through a regulated security. The DeFi market, while young and prone to hacks, has grown from $1 billion in early 2020 to $56 billion in total volume locked, value locked into protocols this month. Bitwise CIO Matthew Hogan says, quote, there's a huge amount of venture capital pouring into the space. The block reports that Uniswap, Aave, Synthetix, Maker, Compound, Uma, Yearn Finance, Zero X, and Loopring will make up the diversified fund. Also in the DeFi roundup, flash loans were once again used to attack a DeFi application on February 13th when an attacker exploited Alpha Homora's V2 code and stole roughly $38 million. The resulting debt will be worked out between the Alpha team and Cream V2 as the nature of the attack affected protocol-to-protocol -protocol lending, not protocol-to-consumer lending. Next headline, the first North American Bitcoin ETF starts trading. The first North American Bitcoin Exchange Traded Fund, or ETF, began at trading in Canada Thursday. The Purpose Bitcoin ETF trades under one ticker, btcc.b, for the Canadian dollar-denominated version, and another ticker, btcc.u, for the U.S. De dollar-denominated version. While multiple close and crypto funds exist in North America, such as Canada's 3IQ and the digital currency group's Grayscale Trust, an ETF allows for the crypto-backed investment vehicles to be traded on a continual basis instead of only at initial offerings and reopenings. At least one analyst sees this as a good sign a U.S. one will be approved soon. And on that note, on Tuesday, NYDIG, the crypto unit of Stone Ridge Holdings Group, filed for a Bitcoin ETF with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission in the hopes that 2021 will be the year the SEC finally relents. Next headline. Bitcoin mining in North America poised to take off as debate over environmental impact continues. Coindex reported Tuesday that Bitcoin miners made $354 million last week, a new record for weekly revenue. The block estimated that, quote, 
Institutional investors in North America have allocated more than half a billion dollars to mining equipment over the past few months, with at least 10 institutions announcing pre-bulk orders since October 2020. In addition to investing in mining hardware, Luxor Technologies announced a 725,000 pre-seed round backed by Argo Blockchain, Celsius Network, and others. However, the long-standing controversy around the environmental impact of Bitcoin heated up this week. According to an analysis by Cambridge University, if Bitcoin were a country, it would rank in the top 30 of all countries in terms of its energy consumption. Tim Swanson, founder and director of research at Post Oak Labs, published a salty article that estimated future Bitcoin energy consumption could be roughly equivalent to the U.S., quote, without seeing anywhere near the economic output, if the price ever reached $1 million per Bitcoin. He views Bitcoin as an inferior alternative to the current financial infrastructure, writing, quote, Bitcoin currently uses about three orders of magnitude more computing machinery than Fedwire, yet processes and secures significantly less. It is monumentally less efficient per watt on purpose. In response to what she called mining FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, Meltem Demirers, chief strategy officer at CoinShares, created a website titled BitcoinWillNotBoilTheOcean.com, which will publish, quote, well-supported, credible, academic, and independent research on the side of Bitcoin mining. Andy Estrom, author of Why Buy Bitcoin, and Peter McCormack, the host of What Bitcoin Did, also published an essay saying Bitcoin mining could be used to build renewable energy centers in rural and remote areas, bringing them online. Time for fun bits! If you haven't yet seen the video of the three-year-old Lily explaining Bitcoin, you absolutely have to stop everything and watch it now. Since it's Lily's show, I won't say more, but this is possibly the most adorable explanation of Bitcoin that is on the interwebs. All right, that's it. Thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Leah and Girl Gone Crypto, be sure to check out the links in the show notes of this episode. Don't forget, we are now on YouTube. Subscribe to the Unchained Podcast YouTube channel today. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with all from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Dan Edelbeck, Shashank, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening. And don't forget, next week we will be on the uh, Unchained podcast feed.